All right, well, welcome to Challenge again. My name's Brian. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to, love to meet you at some point. Uh, so if you're interested, I'd love to meet you after Challenge sometime. Just come introduce yourself. Um, we've been going through this, this series called Unentitled, Finding Freedom in the Shadow of the Cross, going through 1 Corinthians. But we took a break last week because we were out swing dancing at uh, Brits Farm, so that was really fun. Glad you guys came out. It was a really good time. Who won the pumpkin contest, by the way? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know. I don't think I even got to see it. I think the ones that won were out of my sight. So, I'd like to see a picture. Um, but anyway, we're gonna hop right back in our series, and just it's been a, it's been a couple weeks. So I want to refresh you of where we've been. We've been talking about how the good news of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sins and how his resurrection, his bodily resurrection, have a huge impact on all of life. If you go all the way back, we spent chapters one through four talking about how this idea of Christ crucified for our sins deals with us in our area of our pride and how we have division among believers, how we compete and compare with each other. But in light of the cross, we have to face the reality that our sin was required, the cross was required by our sin. And as we fix our eyes on the cross of Christ and realize the depth of our sin, it creates a humility and a servanthood to where we can come together and serve rather than compare and compete. So that's the message of the cross, how it impacts our pride and our division. And then in chapter five and six, and now a little bit in chapter seven, Paul turns to sexuality. How does the cross of Christ impact our sexuality, our views on that? And if you remember in chapter five, the church had been tolerant and celebrating some ongoing unrepentant sexual sin. They had this this view that we have the right to do anything sexually. And this sin was creeping through their community. And Paul says, you have been bought with a price as a community, and you are to represent Christ in a lost community, and the sin was working through the entire church, affecting their powerful witness among the lost. And so he tells them, no, we need to deal with sin in the community seriously. And then Jim talked about, in a great message from chapter six, about their view on sex, this right that they could do anything, where they thought, you know, Sex is just another bodily urge, like, like eating. So it's okay to eat food. So if I have sexual urges, it's okay to have sex. It's not a big deal. It has no impact on us. Because in their minds, the body would be destroyed. But Paul says, no, the body is going to be resurrected. And it's meant for the Lord for eternity. What we do with our bodies impacts our soul. It damages our body and our soul. And so Paul said, flee sexual immorality because in the cross... You were bought with a price. You're not your own. Honor God with your bodies. And so now we're going to look at chapter 7, just the first five verses tonight. And we're going to continue this idea of how do we honor God with our bodies and our view of sex and sexuality. Paul's going to talk about it in the context of marriage. And I'll talk about where we're going with that here in a minute. But first I want to show this this chart. Uh, This this shows some of the views in Corinth. So on this side... uh, It's the chapter 6 view. Some of the people in Corinth, they had this view that we have the right to do anything with our body. It's a dualistic view of creation where the body, our material existence, is separate from our spiritual existence, our soul. And so they, they are us, but they're not together. They're mashed together, but they're separate. So what we do with our bodies, sex, is irrelevant. We're spiritual people. So we can do whatever we want with our body. It's going to be destroyed anyway. But then on this side, this is what he's dealing with in chapter 7. There's another group of people in Corinth saying, no, in fact, that's not true. It's actually not good for a man to have sex with a woman at any time. Another dualistic view of creation where the body is separate from our soul. And so they're disconnected. But their view was, no, actually the body, the material world, matter, sex, it's evil, And so the spirit is good, so we need to throw away everything that is evil, including sex. And so they're writing Paul this letter, and they're talking about, what do we do with this? We're married, and we've come to Christ, and we think sex is evil. And so they're grappling with what to do with that. 
And then here's Paul's view of sex. This comes from what Jim talked about, what we're going to talk about tonight. But actually, in the creation, the created order, we are an integrated unit. We are actually embodied souls. They are integrated, not separate, body and spirit. Body and sex in our spirit are created and good. And they're in the proper context of marriage. But the body and the spirit together will be resurrected. They are both eternal. So the body doesn't get destroyed. It lasts for eternity. And so we are designed as, as embodied souls to enjoy the gift of our bodies and the material world and sex, but in the right context of marriage. And so we've seen in chapter 6, he addresses the one extreme that we have the right to do anything, but now he's answering questions that are informed by this other extreme view, sex is evil. We can't do anything with it. And so they've kind of, some of them are swinging this pendulum back and forth. And so before we move on, I want to talk about how this Corinthian view is actually very similar to our culture's view on creation. This uh, dualistic view. Theory is called personhood theory. Some of you may have seen this in some of your classes, but this is the personhood theory. Um, a lot of these thoughts come from a book by Nancy uh, Piercy called Love Thy Body. It's a really good book. Um, she gets a little political for my taste, but she, she talks about this theory pretty well. And so in this theory, it's the same kind of basic ideas that on one side, humanity is split. We think of being human is having a body. We're made of matter. That's being human. But just because you're a human doesn't mean you are a person. A person is determined by your morality, your ethics, your spirit. And so this is where all this impacts our thoughts on abortion, on gender identity, on sex, everything. This forms our cultural view on these topics. So the issue of abortion is no longer are they human? Everybody agrees they're human. The cells come together. They're human. They're made of matter. But now the question is, when does a baby become a person? Because body and spirit are separate. They're not an embodied unit. And so this is our culture. Human is body. Person is morality, ethics. Um, Francis Schaeffer, a famous theologian, said this is the lower story, this observable by science, the body and matter. The upper story is what's non-observable by science, this idea of morality and ethics. And so our culture says, okay, observable by science, it's fact. That is what's fact. It's biological. We can measure it with science. Whereas the idea of ethics and morality and spirituality, the values are in the soul realm, and they're disconnected. So the one side, I guess you guys are looking at it this way, no value is in the body. It's irrelevant to what I do. My body may communicate one thing, but it's irrelevant to who I am or what I do, but the value comes in our mind and our consciousness. And this is one of the ways our culture deals with the painful, confusing thing of gender dysphoria. That's how we make sense of it. Well, our body is separate from our personhood. And so my body says one thing, my spirit and my mind says one thing, and the way our culture answers that is we, we are in a dualistic world, body and spirit separate but kind of mashed together. How do we make sense of that? In this view, sex is merely physical, it's lower story, where love is spiritual, it's upper story. So I learned a new term, uh, now I'm going to forget it, oh gosh. Situation, uh, situationship. So, yeah, so I know this term now. But that's what this comes from. I can go and have a sex partner. I can have a partner that I have sex with, but I'm not in a relationship. I don't love this person because love is in this upper story. My sex and my body is in this lower story, so they're disconnected. I can have a situationship without offering my soul and my person. And then in this view the body has no moral value, but the morality is in the mind and the consciousness. So this, what Paul is addressing in these two chapters really hits home with our cultural view, this dualistic view, but God says no. We are embodied souls. We are not split. Soul and body are together. And Paul addresses this dualistic worldview here head on. Like I said, Paul, or Paul, Jim's pretty close to Paul, but Jim uh, talked about, I have the right to do anything in chapter six. Now he's going to answer the question uh, that they're asking about sex is not good, 
and how that impacts marriage. So my goal tonight is to help you see Paul's view of sex and its implications for marriage, but then I want to see for you guys to grapple, as most of you are single, how do you grapple with these things as a single person? How can you begin to train yourself to have an appropriate view of sex in marriage? Because a high percentage of you will be married someday. And so if we transition to chapter 7, remember the last two verses of chapter 6, Paul says, you are not your own, you were bought at a price, now honor God with your bodies. And now he's going to apply that to these questions about marriage, and then later we're not going to get to it just because of time. He talks about questions about divorce and uh, things like that, but it all has to do with this view of sex. So let's dive in and talk about God's view of sex in marriage and how that impacts you as a college student. So the first thing, let's read the uh, first uh, three verses here. So he says, now for the matters you wrote about, and he quotes them, this is their slogan they're living by, it is good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman. So it's, it's good to abstain from sex because it's evil. But now he's challenging that thought. He says, okay, but since sexual immorality is going on, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. And so what Paul is saying here is sex is good. It's not bad. Sex is good. These people are wanting to be married and not have sex. Or later in the chapter they're saying we should get divorced because sex is bad. We've come to Christ. Now we can't have sex. And so he says, no, sex is good, and it's actually an important responsibility to fulfill in marriage for both the husband and a wife. So apparently there's this collision going on of these two worldviews in Corinth. Some of the spouses are saying, sex is evil, I've come to Christ, and now sex is evil, I can't have anything to do with those bodily urges. And so they're withholding sex, at least one of them is. And then the other side of the marriage is believing, well, Okay, my sexual urges aren't being met, so I have the right to do anything, and they're getting back into their old habits of sexual immorality. So this could be maybe going back to the temple prostitutes, or maybe the regular practice of husbands of that day was you have a concubine for your daily sexual needs, you have a mistress for these flings that are romantic and passionate, and then you've got your wife. And that was normal culture for them. And so in one sense, sex is evil, I'm withholding it. On the other sense, I can do anything I want. My sex is driving me, so I'm going back to these old habits. That's what Paul is writing into to try to answer this question. And he says, okay, sex is not bad. It's actually good, and it's an important responsibility for each spouse to fulfill in marriage. It's more than just a necessary evil. It's a marital responsibility for each spouse to be aware to be observant of your spouse's sexual needs and to sacrificially serve to meet those needs. So Paul is saying to be spiritually mature in the area of sexuality in marriage. It's not do whatever I want. It's not sex is bad and to be avoided. Sexual maturity is to have the habit of considering your spouse's sexual needs and lovingly serving them. So if you think about how our culture def defines sex, it's a little different than Paul here. He says, at the heart of sex is observation and serving. Observing and serving lie at the heart of sexual maturity and sexual satisfaction in marriage. If you want to have a satisfying sex life, observe and serve as a spouse. And as a spouse, you're going to need to be attuned. You're going to have to pay attention. You're going to have to be working to understand, to observe your spouse's needs and to lay your life down to serve those needs. 1 Peter 3, 7 says it this way to the husbands. Be considerate as you live with your wives. This means they are to actively consider the needs of their wives. This mutual equality in marriage was unheard of in Roman marriages. The husbands had all the rights. The women had none and here Paul is elevating women to men, saying both the women and the men are commanded to consider each other's needs, to sacrificially serve rather than focusing on their own sexual needs and demanding each other to meet them. So as a single person, now to prepare yourself for marriage, you need to train yourself to be an observant servant. This flies in the face of our culture 
in the area of sex. Our culture is trying to disciple you. You're being discipled in your views of sex by something. Our culture, pornography, Hollywood, all these things, they are shaping you. Pornography, masturbation, romantic fantasies, they train us to constantly think about my sexual needs, what I'm missing, what I need from another person, and we are trained to think of another person created in the image of God as an object to be used to satisfy my needs. We, use, uh, we turn a person into an object to meet our physical or emotional needs because we're consumed with them. It trains us to be selfish. It trains us to be demanding and to use people rather than what Paul is talking about here. And I want to challenge you to have a deep repentance about your view of sex. Paul says the heart of a sex life in marriage is to observe and to serve not to think of my need and feed, observe and serve. And so it takes a while to learn this. So I'm going to be sharing some personal examples from my life and my marriage. I've had to learn to observe and serve sexual needs in my marriage. So surprise, surprise, my wife and I have different sexual needs. Imagine that. A man and a woman have different needs. Most do. So I've had to learn how to observe the needs of my wife and to sacrificially serve to meet those needs. My wife has a need to feel loved and cherished and romanced. Those are her sexual needs. And I can lose sight of my responsibility. It is my God-given responsibility, and it's a good thing to serve her in this way. But I get busy. I forget about things. I lose track of it. And also, on top of that, my past views and my experiences of sex shape my worldview. So, get a little personal here. Before we got married, uh, I used charm and romance to manipulate women to try to have sexual relationships with me. I came to Christ, and God began to transform that area of my life. I saw how manipulative and how wrong that was, and I was repenting of that sin but the problem was, kind of like the Corinthians, now all of a sudden, instead of seeing it for what it was, I considered romance and charm as evil and manipulative. And so we get married, and I'm like thinking, okay, I want to romance my wife, but really that's manipulative, and I, it's used to get something out of her. And so I just wasn't doing it. I was like moving away from that. And so we began to talk, and she's like, no, I need that. From you. I need romance. I need to feel precious and honored and loved in this area of sex and marriage. And, and it was like I had to repent of that. I didn't need to throw the romance out. I needed to use it in a proper way to observe and serve her needs rather than say it's evil and throw it out. And some people are like this with sensuality once they get married. They think, oh, this is evil. And so they throw it out rather than thinking, no, this is a need. I'm using it to bless my spouse. So now, even just a couple weeks ago, this is something I think about. How am I doing at meeting my, need, or my wife's needs for romance? To feel cherished, to know I'm delighting in her when we're not around each other. And I was just thinking, I'm not doing very well at this. I need to think about how can I send flowers, how can I give little gifts, write notes, write love notes, encouraging notes to her, to know she's cherished throughout the day. Because I just forget about it. But it is a sexual responsibility to your spouse, and I have to train myself to think that way, to consider actively her needs and to meet those needs, sacrificially serve to meet them. And so it's good. It's a responsibility in marriage. And so how are we going to do with this as individuals in a single state? So first of all, are you training yourself to observe the needs of others and sacrificially serve them? Think about your roommates. Think about the tower of dishes in your kitchen. It's kind of funny, but I'm serious. How many of you think there's this, I'm in a hurry, I've got my dirty dishes, and I think, oh, I'm just going to put these down and let somebody else do them. And the Jenga pile keeps going up, right? Right? If you're not willing to observe and serve in that setting, you're not going to be able to observe and serve in marriage. Bottom line, 
We need to grow up. We need to observe and serve, to put others' needs above our own. How are you training yourself to observe and serve? When you walk into a room, do you scan the room and say, what needs to happen here? What, what needs need to be met either personally or things need to be done? How can I train myself to give sacrificially to meet another's needs? If you start doing that now and training yourself to do that, and your spouse, you meet a spouse that does that, you'll have a great sex life because you've learned to observe and serve. So if you're looking for someone and you're wanting to date someone and you see that they are not observant and they are not a servant, don't date them. I'm serious. I'm not joking. I'm serious. You want to find someone who is an observant servant because it won't miraculously happen in marriage. Secondly, are you training to focus your, on your sexual needs and to use others to meet those needs through pornography, romantic fantasy, masturbation, I mean, you name it. Are you in the middle of training yourself and your brain to constantly think of what I need and to use someone else to meet my sexual needs? If that's where you're at, I want you to share that with someone. I want you to get some help to repent of it and get some help to grow out of that because that will be, get brought into your marriage. Your view of sex, to think of my needs and to take from a person will, will be brought into your marriage. And then third, are you training yourself to learn and to understand and value the needs of the opposite sex? Just as friends, I mean, not, not any you know, romantic things, but just talk with your friends that are women, with your friends that are guys, like, what are, what are your guys' needs? How are you different, you know? Are you learning to value those things and then learn to serve them in other ways? Understand and value those things. You know, I hear guys say, women are too emotional or too sensitive, and it's a derogatory term. It's like, that's, that's dumb. That's a valuable thing that you need to learn from. Value it and serve them. Learn how to serve them. If you're going to become a spouse who considers the sexual needs of your spouse and sacrificially serve to meet them, you've got to learn now. You've got to go to school now about how to observe and serve. Hold each other accountable. Set some goals. Grow in this area. It'll be valuable in your marriage. So that's the first thing. It's good and it's a responsibility to actively consider the other's needs and to sacrificially serve. Observe and serve. The second thing we see here says sex is good in marriage, and there's an interesting thing here. Neither a wife nor a husband have authority over their own body in marriage. Now, this has been misunderstood a lot, so I'm going to clarify that. But let's read this verse, and I'll talk about what it means. So he says, remember, there's some withholding sex. There's some running to sexual immorality, and he says, okay, Here's the deal. It's good. It's a responsibility to share with each other. But the wife does not have authority over her own body, but she yields it to her husband. But in the same way, the husband also does not have authority over his own body, but yields to his wife. Do not deprive each other. So Paul's argument here, because we have been bought with a price, we are not our own. We are embodied souls. Christ has authority over our bodies at salvation. We do not have authority over how we use our bodies. But now Paul adds another layer. When you say yes to a covenant relationship of marriage, there is a joyful, a willing giving up of the authority of your body to your spouse. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But when you get married and you make these vows, you are saying, I'm laying the authority of what I do with my body at your feet and I'm yielding it to you. I'm not going to take authority and control of my body anymore. I defer my bodily preferences and needs to your bodily preferences and needs. It's a big commitment. So Paul is speaking to both sides of the issue here. One spouse is taking authority over their own body by withdrawing sex. And that's just not, okay, I don't feel like it right now. That's not what that means. It's withholding it. There's this, I'm not moving that way. But the other spouse is also taking control and authority over their body by running to sexual immorality. And Paul is rebuking both of them. He says, you don't have authority over your body. You've been bought with a price. And you've given authority to your spouse in marriage. You need to trust your spouse and you need to trust your Lord to meet your sexual needs. Now, this verse has been really misused by men 
And in fact, a few years ago, we had to have kind of a heart-to-heart with some challenge guys that were talking about this in the wrong way. This has been often used as a manipulative voice for husbands to say, okay, I got to play this card. When my wife says no to sex, I can play this card and say, well, you're, you don't have authority over your body, so I should have sex anytime I want. That's how it's used a lot of times. That is not the point of the passage. In fact, it's twisting it on its head. It's not the intention. The point of the idea is this mutual giving, this mutual sacrifice of my authority of my body for your needs by the husband and the wife. It's not a forceful trump card to play on someone, but he's saying this is the heart of marriage that I long to serve and bless the other, and it's mutual. Again, this is unheard of in Roman marriages. If a guy wanted sex in a Roman marriage, it happened. He's like, no, the husband as well gets rid of his authority of his body and gives it to his wife. They trust the Lord and their spouse for their sexual needs. So this word deprive, he says, don't deprive anyone. It's really the idea of defraud. It's kind of like he's saying, stop defrauding each other. It's the same word used in 1 Corinthians 6, and it's in chapter, or verses 7 and 8. And it's describing a situation where these believers are cheating each other, um, they're wronging each other. They're taking something that is rightfully another person's. And that's what he's saying. He says, when you're withholding or you're running to sexual immorality, you are defrauding your spouse of something that is theirs. And so withholding sex is stealing from what is your spouse's. And running around in sexual immorality is stealing, taking your sexuality that should be your spouse's and putting it somewhere else. And so what does this look like in marriage? And then we'll get to what does it look like for you guys. So, you know, most people don't talk about these things. So I talked to my wife and and she said, I'm good to talk about it. So we're going to talk about it. Because we figured this out on our own. And I don't know if it's right or wrong, but hey, we figured this out. So we're going to talk about what kind of how it might work in us. So believe it or not, in marriage, there are times when one spouse wants to have sex and the other doesn't. Believe it or not, that happens. And so there are times when someone pursues someone sexually and then for whatever reason, the other person doesn't desire it or can't do it for whatever reason. And so how do you apply this verse in that reality? So here's how it works for us. Again, I talked to Mindy. She's cool with this. (laughs) Don't be like daggers at me, you know. So let's just say theoretically. I'm not going to talk about a certain evening or anything. So... Let's just say, theoretically. (laughs) Uh, I get into trouble. Okay. I'm sorry for my kids that are in the room. (laughs) Can we turn the air conditioning up a little bit? It's getting getting warm in here. Okay. All right. Let's bring it in. Lasso it in here. Come on. All right. So, a situation might come up. Where I'm pursuing my wife in this way, sexually, but maybe she's had an extremely long day. Maybe her mind is exhausted and emotionally she's fried, and I'm just like, hey, you know, let's, can we pursue each other sexually? What happens in that situation when we say, what does it look like to say, okay, I'm giving up my authority of my body to you? How it looks like is she might say something like, give me some time to pray about this. Let me ponder and think and talk to Jesus about this, and let me see if he kind of turns my heart in that direction and gives me some mental energy and some emotional energy and physical energy. This is what it looks like to say, okay, I'm going I'm to bring before Jesus and submit my body before him. Sometimes that moves forward, and sometimes it doesn't. Other times, it's like, my heart's just not coming around. So what does that look like? Does that mean I say, hey, I'm playing this card. You've given your authority of your body to me. I have sexual needs. No. No, it means it applies to me. I have given my authority of my bodily desires to my wife, and I surrender it to her. I elevate her physical needs, her mental needs above my own. And I lay down my desires 
Do you see how that works? It's not this leverage to be used. We're both trying to outdo each other in laying down our lives for each other to offer our bodies to each other, to bless each other. So that's kind of what it looks like. It's a little window into what that might look like in marriage. It's to remind ourselves not what I need and you give your body to me. No, it's like, okay, here's your needs. I'm going to submit my body to you. And it's mutual. It's a beautiful thing. So as a single person, what do you do to begin to prepare for this in marriage? I think you start to train yourself to surrender your sexual needs of your body to Jesus. You learn to surrender your sexual needs of your body to Jesus. You are sexual creatures right now, but he has said sex is in the context of marriage. And so right now, your boundary is no sexual expression. So the question is, are you taking authority of your body in your own hands? Are you using sexual immorality? Are you using your body, taking authority of it, to use it for sexual immorality to escape or medicate emotions like anxiety, anger, loneliness, insecurity, boredom? Are you saying, I have authority over my body. I'm going to use it this way to meet my needs. If so, that is outside the will of God. And I know it's hard. I'm, I'm human. I understand that. I was single. But we train ourselves to trust Jesus to meet our needs. Another way we can do this is, am I taking authority over my body by closing myself off, by blocking myself and distancing myself from others, from relational intimacy, especially with the opposite sex, to protect myself? Am I putting up all these walls, controlling and taking authority of my body? Well, you are not going to penetrate my heart because it's self-protection. Am I controlling and taking authority of my body or am I trusting it to Jesus and his ways? Because you're gonna bring those habits into marriage. So you need to think about it. So again, a personal example of what that looked like in my life. Growing up, I was in the habit of taking authority of my own body and I used sexual immorality to deal especially with the area of anger and conflict. So I'd have these arguments with my parents uh, I didn't get along with my dad in high school, especially. And so we'd have these arguments. I'd get so angry and I'd so frustrated. And so I'd go downstairs in my room, watch some inappropriate show, and act out sexually. I was taking authority over my body to handle what was going on in my body. That's how I dealt with anger, conflict. It's how I dealt with loneliness. It's how I dealt with a lot of things, actually. And so instead of taking the time to recognize what's going on in my heart, what am I feeling, what am I thinking, and talking to Jesus about it and talking to other Jesus followers about it so they could help me, I would just medicate or avoid them by taking authority over my body and using sexual immorality. And so I came to Christ. Those things started to change. I started getting obedience in those areas, had a really good stretch. And so Mindy and I get married and guess what? We have a fight. Can you believe it? We had a fight. And what do you think, what temptation do you think came on when we had our first fight? All of a sudden, there was this big temptation to masturbate. Why? It was like this total surprise to me back then, but it's like my views and my habits of having authority over my body to deal with those things got brought into my marriage. I'd trained myself for years. That's how you deal with Conflict, that's how you deal with anger. You don't talk about it, you medicate by using your body. And all of a sudden, this wave of temptation hit me. I'm like, what is going on? It's because I had disciplined myself. I'd been discipled to take authority of my body and deal with those things in a sexual way. I had to repent because I had trained myself to take authority over my body. I had to give it to Jesus and to my wife. And so we've got to repent of relying on ourselves for our sexual fulfillment by taking authority over our bodies in our own hands. We are not our own. We are embodied souls. We were bought with a price. 
we have to train ourselves to become people who entrust our body's needs to Jesus first. And then, as we learn that, we'll be ready for a spouse. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be growing. And so the question is, are you going to commit to that? Will you train yourself? Will you talk to someone about how you're taking authority over your body and using it for your own gain rather than trusting Jesus with those deeper needs? It's hard, you know, you gotta have some help. You can't just figure it out on your own. So I wanna conclude here and wrap it up. So Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians here that we are embodied souls. What we do with our bodies matters. We're not separate bodies and separate souls. We are embodied souls that have been bought with a price. And we do not have the right to do whatever we want with our bodies. On the other hand, our bodies and our sexuality are good in the right context. They're not evil. God made us and declared in our sexuality, in our bodies, that we were very good at creation. And so two things. If we're going to be spiritually mature in the area of sexuality, one thing from this passage is we need to understand sex is good within the context of marriage and to learn it's a responsibility to observe the needs of the other and to lay down our lives and to serve the other's needs. We've got to train ourselves to observe and serve rather than to fix our eyes on our need and feed. That's the first thing. Secondly, to be spiritually mature in the area of sex is we need to see sex is good within marriage and to learn to joyfully surrender the authority of our bodies to Christ now as singles so that we'll be prepared to do that with our spouse. We lay down our bodily desires for the good of our spouse and we train ourselves to submit the authority of our bodies to Jesus then let him meet our sexual needs. So as we do that, I'm gonna share just a process, a gospel-centered process of growth, and I'll just filter it through this area. So if I've talked about some things, observe and serve, or taking authority of your own body, maybe something connected with you. The first step of gospel-centered growth is to confess your sin. To confess your sin to a friend, confess it to Jesus, something like, you know, I am not observant at all. I see one inch in front of my nose, and that's all I think about is what's right in front of me. I am not a servant by heart at all. We could just confess that. Say, I'm not an observant servant. Or, God, I've just had this habit of taking authority over my body, and I use it through sexual immorality to meet my needs rather than trusting Christ. We confess it. That's the first thing. And as we confess that sin, then we commit to the way of Christ. We say, I turn from that, and now I'm going this way. I'm going to commit to live as an observant servant. I'm going to train myself to be observant and to serve. I'm going to train myself and get help to offer my body to Christ. And so we do that. We start trying to obey. We start practicing. We get some help. And guess what? You're going to fail. You're going to fail. I fail. Everybody fails. When we fail, we share it openly with Christ, we share it with others, but then we repent again and we fix our eyes on Jesus. And this is the part that's so beautiful. Instead of, you know, you could walk away from a message like this, work hard, grit your teeth, do it right. That's not the point. The point is we fix our eyes on Jesus because he is our example, he is our substitute, and he is our power. So here's what it looks like. As an example, if you're failing as a servant, you fix your eyes on Jesus in worship, And you say, you are the perfect observation. You are the perfect servant. You observe needs better than anybody else, and you gave your life away for people, and I worship you because you do what I can't. Or in the idea of surrendering the authority of his body, you say, Jesus, you did it perfectly. You surrendered your body to the cross to obey the Father. You you gave up your needs to follow Jesus, or to follow the Father. So we worship When we fail, we turn our eyes on Jesus as our example and we worship him as the perfect example. And then we look at him him as our substitute. When I fail to serve or to observe things, I don't beat myself up. I look at Jesus in worship and then I say, I remind myself that Jesus is my righteousness. When God looks at me, he sees the perfect observing servant of Jesus because his blood 
covers my life. And because Jesus is covering me, that's who God sees. I am accepted before God. And when, G- when the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus' perfect bodily surrender to the Father on my behalf. It's on Jesus' effort, not on mine. And then finally, we see him as our power. His spirit empowers us to become like him. We abide with Christ. That's the whole idea. We walk with Jesus intimately. His life of being an observant servant flows through us as we walk with him. His life is surrendering our bodies to Jesus uh, to meet our needs. It flows through us. And as we do, we receive this fresh power of the spirit to commit again. That's just this ongoing growth. Well, I'm going to have the worship team come up, and I'm going to pray for you. And... um, We're going to continue to offer our hearts to God in worship. Lord, I thank you, uh, first of all, just for the honesty of your word. Lord, I thank you that you deal with things that are challenging to us. You deal with things maybe that are hard to talk about. But God, we thank you that you have made us as embodied souls with a body and a soul and that you've created sex as a good thing in the right context. We thank you for that, God. But I know all of us have a twisted view and experience of sex and sexuality. I know I do. I'm still unlearning those things. God, I pray that for this group of students... God, I pray that your spirit would fill them to become like you, to be observant of the needs of others and to lay their lives down sacrificially for their roommates, for their family, for their friends, for classmates. God, that we would get our eyes off of our own needs, off of our own issues, and we would look outward and to see what are the needs around me? How can I sacrifice for the good of another? And God, I pray that as they do that, as they commit to that, that you would begin to develop them into someone that would be a great spouse, that would give of themselves to think of the needs of others and sacrifice for their spouse. And God, I pray probably most of us in some way have taken authority over our bodies from you. God, I just pray in these moments that we would surrender that, God, that we would say, I'm I'm trying to take control. I'm trying to take authority over my body. I just confess that to you. And God, would you bring repentance and that we would offer our bodies to you and surrender and that you would begin to meet us in ways that would blow us away, that you would meet us in ways that meet our loneliness, that meet our boredom, that meet our anxiety and our insecurities, and that it would fill us with your presence rather than running to sexual immorality or self-protection. God, would you enable us to see and to hear and to open our minds to conceive what you want to speak to us today. We need your spirit. So would you do that in these moments to confess and repent? trust you.